In 1979, a question kicked off a movement. Linda McKeever Bullard was a lawyer representing community members in a lawsuit against the Southwestern Waste Management Corporation. It was trying to build a landfill in a Houston community with an 82% black population. She asked her husband, sociology professor Robert Bullard, where the other landfills in Houston were, and he took the question to his students. They discovered that even though only 25% of Houston's population was black, black neighborhoods hosted all of the city's five garbage dumps and three of its four privately owned landfills. And theirs was far from the only city with this kind of issue. In North Carolina, protests broke out when the state planned to dump thousands of truckloads of toxic soil in Warren County, which had mostly black residents. And in 1968, residents of West Harlem in New York City tried to stop a sewage treatment plant from being built in their community. In each of these cases, the residents were unsuccessful in their attempts to protect their communities from harmful substances. But for Bullard and many other black, Latino, Asian, Pacific Islander, and indigenous Americans, the stage was set for a movement. Hi, I'm Miriam Nielsen, and this is Study Hall Sustainability. After finding out about the Houston landfills, Robert Bullard published books and research on environmental racism, and his work has inspired countless others to understand the issues and get involved. He became known as the father of environmental justice. When we talk about environmental justice, we mean there should be fair distribution of environmental burdens and benefits. In other words, we should all get to live, work, and play in garbage-free environments, and no one should be more likely than anyone else to live near garbage. And that's easier said than done, because most of our systems are not set up to promote equitable exposure to garbage because too many people in power are benefiting from the garbage. And by garbage, I mean garbage, but also lots of other toxic things. For example, farm workers in the United States who are mostly Latino immigrants are often exposed to agricultural pesticides. That can have immediate and long-term detrimental health effects, including headaches, nausea, reproductive problems, and cancer. And the harmful use of these pesticides isn't up to the people working in the fields. The people who own the farms and make the most money from the crops are the ones making the decision to use pesticides to increase their own earnings at the expense of the health and well-being of their workers. These kind of inequities happen at every level all over the world. The countries, companies, and people producing the most waste and with the most pollution are not the ones feeling the biggest effects of this waste and pollution. That falls on the populations and people with less access to healthcare, education, and the resources that would allow them to fight against the government policies and companies harming them and seek better conditions. It's not just about waste and toxins, either. Climate justice is one part of the environmental justice movement, and it acknowledges that climate change also also has larger, more harmful effects on certain populations. And this isn't speculation. Hundreds of studies show the disproportionate effects of climate change. For example, one report studied the impact of things like extreme temperatures, air quality, and coastal flooding due to climate change. They found that Black Americans are 40% more likely than other groups to live in the areas that will experience more deaths because of extreme temperatures. Latino and Hispanic people are 43% more likely to live in areas where extreme temperatures lead to fewer job opportunities. And Indigenous communities are 48% more likely to be in areas affected by rising sea levels. These kinds of disparities are happening on a global scale, too. Rising sea levels in the Pacific Islands put the indigenous people living there at risk of losing their homes and livelihoods. And humans aren't the only ones affected by these issues. During the 2019 to 2020 bushfire season in Australia, fires killed or displaced 3 billion animals. Unfortunately, hotter and drier conditions are expected to increase wildfire risk, putting billions more critters in harm's way. So when it comes to working for a more sustainable future, we need solutions that will work to protect life all over the planet. And for these solutions to be just, they need to pay special attention to the most vulnerable populations of people and animals, the ones who are most affected by climate change and other environmental concerns. Here's what we mean by that. It's kind of like when we talked about that one-size-fits-all hat. Different communities and people have different needs, and the same solutions won't work for everyone. That's an important consideration when it comes to equity and justice. For example, let's say you go to the library looking for books to help you plan and prepare for a winter camping trip. But all the winter camping books are on the very top shelves, and you can't reach them without doing that weird jump and reach thing or scaling the shelves. And you don't trust that the whole thing won't come down on top of you if you try that. That's equality. Technically, everyone has the same access to those library books, but it kind of sucks because anyone who's not six feet tall has to put in some serious effort to get the books. And short people like winter camping, too. So say the library gets some tools to help everyone reach any book in the library. They have some step stools, some grabber tools with long handles, and even some of those cool library ladders like the one in Beauty and the Beast. 
Much better. You can use whatever tools you need to reach those top shelf books and also live out your childhood Disney dreams. That's equity. Everyone has the support they need so that anyone can reach the books. But there are still barriers. You still need to take the extra step of finding the right tool. So justice in this library would mean the barriers and inequities are removed, and everyone can thrive without having to put in the extra effort to reach the books. And that might require some advanced technology, like, say, at this library, you don't have to deal with shelves at all. Instead, a fancy library robot brings you whatever books you're looking for. Oh wait, that's what librarians are for. Definitely ask your librarian for help. Librarians are great but a library robot would also be fun. Much like sustainability as a whole, pursuing environmental and climate justice isn't just about reacting to problems with hasty short-term solutions like grabby tools and ladders. It takes some real thought and maybe some brand new technology. Put in more environmental terms, if a poisonous invasive plant is chilling in your garden, you don't just snip off the flowers as they bloom. You yank the whole thing out by the roots. So here, we also have to address the underlying root causes that have historically contributed to the social, economic, political, and environmental marginalization of specific communities and groups. Think about housing segregation. In the United States, racism has led to a lot of disparities between the experiences and opportunities available to white people and black people. For example, government policies made it easier for white people to buy suburban homes, and governments gave more financial support for schools and other community resources in these white suburban areas. These practices have led to further disparities between the opportunities and wealth available to black people, so they're more likely to live in areas with fewer resources and more contaminants or pollution, and it's harder for them to move away from these areas. Environmental justice Justice wouldn't just seek to remove pollution and contaminants from these less wealthy areas. It would have to address the underlying racism, systemic issues, and disparities between the resources and opportunities available to these communities. Otherwise, it would be all too easy for the same kinds of problems to occur again in the future, because there would still be unaddressed racial, financial, and other disparities. Overall, we have to understand why and how people are discriminated against in order to address the resulting environmental inequities. That can mean looking some ugly truths in the face about the way people and systems have treated and are treating each other but it's also the only road to making a meaningful, long-term difference. But there's not just one way to address those issues either. Justice is just as complicated as the problems it tries to fix, and there are lots of different ways to think about justice. For one, there's distributive justice, which is about making sure what people receive is fair, which doesn't necessarily mean it's equal. Like when it comes to climate change, it'd be reasonable to think that every country should be limited to net zero carbon emissions. But hang on, some countries like the US have prospered because of fossil fuel for decades, and they got a big head start on polluting the globe and benefiting economically from it. Other developing countries haven't gotten close to those numbers, and they're still trying to build up industry and stable economies. So distributive justice would call for a fairer solution. Maybe wealthy countries would be required to have negative emissions, capturing more carbon than they emit, and maybe those countries would be asked to fund renewable energy projects for their developing neighbors. Meanwhile, procedural justice is about fairness in how we decide what people receive. Instead of just having to accept the end result, we should all have access to information about these processes and be participants in the decisions. So when we create climate policies, they should be approved by every stakeholder. Restorative justice might come in to support those who have already been harmed by climate injustice. So individuals and communities might be given money or access to healthcare or housing that helps them heal and move to a less harmful area. Finally, retributive justice is about penalizing those who cause harm. So countries and companies that pollute or have high emissions could pay fees or suffer other consequences. Like, US Congress passed a law in 1986 that collects and publishes information on toxic polluters. And the European Union has a European Pollutant Emissions Register, which is a public list of the continent's biggest polluters. It's basically a wall of shame, and ideally, it encourages facilities to lower emissions. But all of this can feel pretty abstract and far away, about as likely as every library in the US getting a fancy robot. But there are people and organizations who have been working toward environmental justice for decades, and their work continues. At the community level, people can take action to reduce water pollution, create access to healthy local food, promote clean energy, provide disaster prep and relief, and more. For instance, the grassroots initiative Conscious Contractors in Miami helps prepare members of Little Haiti immigrant community for hurricanes. They board up windows, get rid of fallen trees, and bring people to hurricane shelters. Promoting environmental and climate justice in urban communities can also be as simple as creating more green spaces, like parks, greenways, and gardens. Research has found that better access to these spaces can help reduce the health disparities disparities experienced by people of color in low-income communities. So in Detroit, where only 6% of the area is green space, local organizations like the Working With Lots program help locals transform vacant lots into gardens, parks, and community spaces. But as effective as this kind of action can be, it's also critical that governments implement larger-scale policies to expand environmental and climate justice. We need change across all levels, which will require top-down regulation. 
For example, over 40% of countries in the United Nations now have constitutions that protect the rights of future generations. It's a great step in ensuring environmental justice. Environmental and climate justice are necessary considerations when it comes to pursuing sustainability. And like everything when it comes to sustainability, it can feel like an uphill battle and an unfair fight. But the good news is, the mainstream environmental movement is finally starting to incorporate the ideas of the environmental justice movement. In the past few years, many people have joined conversations about systemic racism, fueled in part by movements like Black Lives Matter and tragic events like the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. With better understanding of the issues and injustice, more and more people are looking for ways to do something about the pervasive system systems and perspectives causing so much disparity in the United States and around the world. In other words, more and more people are looking for justice. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full Study Hall Sustainability course and earning college credit from ASU, check out GoStudyHall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, comment, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching, see you next time.